Welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Sarah Kanza and I'm the host of today's show. Ask an Archaeologist is a series of live streamed co um, interviews co-hosted by the Archaeological Research Facility and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology that we put together for Cal Week 2020. So each day this week at 11 and at 2, we are going to interview a UC Berkeley archaeologist and um, answer audience questions. So before we start today's interview, I want to let you know how you can ask questions. If you open a, a new browser um, or, uh, or on your phone or on your computer, and if you go to sly.do, so that's S-L-I dot D-O, you can type in ask ARF, which is A-S-K-A-R-F, ask ARF, and click on join, and you can type your question in there. You don't have to do any logins or, um, and they don't track users. So it's just an anonymous question that will go into that. So sly.do, type in ask ARF. And I'll also remind you of this partway through the interview. So um, for people who show up late. So today we're going to kick off this series with Professor June Sinceri, who is here to talk with us about zooarchaeology and what a skull can teach us about animal senses. Uh, June is a professor in the Department of Anthropology here at Berkeley. He, his research focuses on colonialism, foodways, landscapes, historical archaeology, preservation, and heritage in the Western US and Northern South Africa. And among many other things, he runs the Bare Bones Lab and teaches courses on zooarchaeology. So thank you for joining us, Professor Sinceri. Um, thank you so for having me. So um, to get started, I just wanted to ask you uh, if you could just tell us what, what is zooarchaeology? So zooarchaeology is the study of animal bones in the context of past human behaviors. So we look at animal bones to understand a little bit more about how people lived in the past. And how is it that you can, uh, what can you learn from it you're looking at? So we can use comparative collections, which means things in museums. We prepare sometimes our own comparative collections, which means getting animal bones processed from the meaty parts of, you know, carcasses from roadkill, from the remains of our own dinners, from things given to us by community partners, um, or sometimes from uh, zoos or other institutions to create. to my son um, by one of our community partners in Arizo, New Mexico, Mr. Nelson Gonzalez, um, from, because uh, he wanted uh, Cooper to have something to remind him of the time spent on the land there, which is a Hanisaro community in northern New Mexico. Um, and uh, deer are very much a part of the culinary traditions of Indo-Hispano peoples in northern ritual paraphernalia when you're dressing up for dances and things like that as well. So um, Grandpa Nelson gave uh, my little boy the skull to take home to remind him of his time that we spend up there uh, with them, in, with the Gonzaleses, Los Gonzaleses in El Rito. Awesome. So you have a specimen like that. Like, tell us what, what can that skull tell you about that animal? All right. So this is the only specimen that I have at home back at the Bare Bones Lab of Bears and BEAR. Uh, we have a lot of comparative collections um, from the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, the UC Museum of Paleontology, um, right? Uh, and from our own collections that we process for ourselves. This particular specimen, the only one I have at home, I, I chose uh, uh, to focus on crania today because there are several hall landmarks uh, in a specimen like this that are useful for archaeologists trying to understand something about the animals that we find. So you might not find an entire skull like this, right, in an archaeological site. You might just find a portion of it, maybe the top of the orbits. Um, and the orientation of the orbits and the size of the orbits with respect to other sensory apparatus on the, on the cranium tell us about this animal's um, herding behavior, which in some cases uh, is adapted by human beings and domesticated for things like bovids, right? Um, but they share the idea of these orientations of sideways looking eyes. Um, the orbits aren't quite as big as uh, in relationship to their nose as animals like a, like a bobcat whose eyes are really big. And 
instead of pointing forward like a bobcat, they point sideways so that they can watch their surroundings and have a much broader range of vision around their head so they could be watching as they're eating for predators that could potentially attack them, right? Of course, um, with domesticated animals, a lot of these um, protective apparatuses are uh, reduced because of uh, people are doing the protecting, right? Uh, where I work in South Africa, there's always somebody on site to protect the animals from predators. Um, but in a case like this, the senses of this animal um, relying upon the shared overlapping patterns of vision to protect the herd, right? As opposed to if um, you are working with the nose and you can see inside the nose here, those fancy reflect uh, how much surface area is being crafted by this animal through its life way um, to collect scent, right? They're much more sensitive than you or I and our noses. Uh, and the scent, uh, maybe scenting, pre scenting predators, sensing the sweet grass that's better over here than over there. Um, those senses allow this animal to, um, to generate more uh, data from their surroundings than you and I could do with our own noses and our own sinuses, right? Um, and even their lips, um, they don't have, uh, you know, they don't have hands to work with. They have those cloven feet, right, those hooves. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna use their lips like their hands and you can see uh, kind of close in here, there's this, uh, there's a foramen. Oh, how do I do this while holding it? Uh, do you see where my middle finger's pointing there, right? That, that little hole uh, allows a bundle of nerves to come out and um, connect to those lips, those meaty lips that they use kind of like fingers as they're reaching around and getting the sweet grass, and plucking the, the nice shoots and stems, the soft, juicy ones, right, from the dry, nasty ones or the thorny ones. Um, and they use that bundle of nerves uh, to do that feeling for them, right? So, so that foramen's a little bit smaller than something like a mountain lion, which uses its whiskers to, to feel around in the dark as it's you know, moving as a, as a kind of a, you know, twilight or nighttime predator, right? So the, the bundle of nerves in this frame is a little bit smaller than it would be in a predatory cat. And so you use those kinds of landmarks, noses, eyes, feelings here to understand a little bit about those senses. And then on the bottom, right, you can see these little echo chambers. There's an ear hole here, the external auditory meatus, right? And it leads towards the auditory bulla. For an animal like this, whose ears do a lot of the work of focusing sound and they can turn them around and gather sound, reflect it into that echoing chamber, the bigger the auditory bolo, the more relative importance there is to that sense, the, to something like eyes, feeling of the mouth, the nose, right? Or what flavors are coming through the riverform plate, things like that from the tongue. So all those different senses can be proportionally compared for the animal and it gives you a sense of what portion of animal you're looking at, but also um, if it's an animal that uh, might be an artiodactyl doing group herding and feeding versus something like a predatory cat, right? Because if you only have just a fragment of it, you have to use all of the available information you have um, to understand what the life way of the animal was to then start drawing conclusions as to what animal you've got and how that fits into the picture of human life from the past, right? Do you have a predatory cat in your archeological site? You gotta wonder, wait a minute, like that's not a food animal. What's that doing there, right? And those kinds of questions of uh, the relationship between people and animals are the kinds of um, human uh, lived experiences that we're interested in as archeologists. So that's um, just a quick, uh, quick and dirty introduction to a deer skull and all the different ways of comparing senses. I hope that was a, uh, a start. Yeah, that's really interesting. Can you talk about the teeth too and what the teeth can tell us oh, about no. the animal, its age and how it eats? Sure, oh, so it says from Grandpa Nelson here. But anyway, um, <laughs> you can see that uh, these teeth, these hypsodont, right? These hypsodont teeth are really, um, really high crowned and they keep growing through the course of the animal's life. So you can see that they're meant for grinding up food, right? Now, different animals, especially domesticated animals whose forage might be reduced because there's territorial circumscription, which means people are reducing the amount of space that those animals can feed in. Um, they may be grazing places um, more thoroughly than they would otherwise because there's only limited range uh, 
uh, available to a given community. Um, tells us a lot about range management pro practices of the, of the past, right? How did people herd their animals over landscapes? What was the relationship between different communities and access to fodder for their animals? So those teeth, um, those grinding teeth may be ground down differentially uh, for different animals that are say domesticated stock versus a wild um, artiodactyl like this guy here um, who can range a lot farther, um, who aren't necessarily pulling up a lot of dirt because they're grabbing the, the, the absolute bottom of the, the, the grass stalks on an over depleted range. Um, maybe people are deciding to keep their sheep and goats close to home because in northern New Mexico, once upon a time, there were raiding parties that would sweep in on horseback and steal livestock and people and take them to other communities to sell them. Um, and so those animals' teeth would reflect the fact that they may be more closely corralled because of those raiding activities, because of the fear of, of raiding. Um, and so the teeth would, would uh, reflect that. We have um, pigs from Gold Rush, San Francisco, uh, where the teeth are barely even erupted. They're still in the crypt, right? The pigs are so uh, young before they're being butchered because uh, during the gold rush, meat was at a premium. They didn't have time to wait for every last sow to get the full age before you butchered them and, and fed them to those people who are jumping ship to run for the gold field. And so for us as archaeologists, seeing a lot of these very young sewids um, being uh, butchered and served up in uh, the tent cities and hotels of San Francisco tells us something about the, the rate at which consumption um, of meat, pro meat and meat pro products uh, accelerated during the rapid expansion of San Francisco from a tiny little sleepy hamlet, a sleepy hamlet, a hamlet of 3,000 to you know, 50,000 people running for the gold fields, right? And we could see that at least partially um, through the teeth of the animals uh, that were being butchered. So what you're saying is that when you study animal bones in archaeology, um, if you have the teeth of the animals, you can tell the age that the animal was when it was when it was killed or when it sure. died. Sure. So with the case in the case of those pigs, some teeth weren't even erupted yet, right? They never even got to expand uh, the teeth. And in places like northern New Mexico, when you have a pig that's uh, been carefully brought to a location where you're trying to get it old enough to have little piglets and create more stock because uh, the Spanish Inquisition is up there, breaking people on the wheel, accusing people of witchcraft. Eating pork was a way of proving you were a good Catholic. Hmm. And so trying to expand your stock of pigs uh, was a critical part of proving your Catholic status. Um, and so those pigs lived to be a lot older. Even just having the pig to say, hey, look, I'm going to eat some pork. I'm not a Muslim, right? That was an important part of performing your Catholicism in a time when um, the church was using terror tactics to uh, crush native religions. And uh, also in the wake of the Iberian Peninsula having been occupied by North African forces who were predominantly Muslim uh, for the preceding 400 years. That's really interesting because usually we think of pig like suckling pig or pig that's you know just reached adulthood it's being nice and fat and that's when you want to eat them and it's interesting right. to think that there'd be a reason to keep them to older for prestige um, right right so i want to remind people who are listening that if you have questions to ask um you can go to open a browser window or on your phone type sli.do and in that site that pops up you can type in ask ARF, A-S-K-A-R-F, and you will be able to type a question in to that site there. And you can um, ask Dr. Sinceri a question about working with animal bones. Um, when you find animal bones in archeological sites, how do you know that they were, people ate them? Like what kinds of traces mm -hmm. do you find on the bones or in, that, that you can tell that they were part of meals? That's an important question because, um, you know, if you have, uh, say, certain rodent bones that may have come in after the site was abandoned or even just infiltrated during the course of the site's occupation, you know, trying to steal, sca you know, scavenge bits of food, um, that's a really different matter than finding a portion of an animal that was actually part of cuisine like this guy, right? This, 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 this animal actually um, found its way to the dinner table uh, in, in El Rito. And some of the taphonomic traces, so taphonomy is the study of 
of, of all the different things that happen to artifacts like animal bone uh, through time. So taphonometrists like cut marks would be an example. Um, and hmm, I could have jacked in my USB microphone microscope for you guys, but I think I'll just let that go for now. Um, but seeing the cut marks, uh, particularly uh, cut marks that belong in places that you have, uh, there's a sense of what you'll be doing with those cut marks, right? So if there's a, a cut mark at the articulation between two elements, that makes sense because people are trying to disarticulate the animal to make it a part of cuisine, right? Um, you need to take the animal body apart. Uh, you don't just throw a whole deer into your orno or into your pot, right? Uh, you know, you're, and you're making little empanadillas, you know, like empanadillas, you know, they're, they're little tiny pockets of, you know, meaty goodness inside pastry. Um, so you need to take it apart, as opposed to a cut mark that's placed elsewhere, perhaps at a muscle attachment to strip off, uh, you know, defleshing, creating uh, big muscle portions. You could uh, create roast from or other things, um, add to stews, you know, uh, round or chuck or loin. Um, and then there's also uh, locations, say uh, at the, uh, the, the extremities of limbs for if you want to skin an animal, right? So there's the location of the cut, mark, the cut marks there um, that maybe, you know, uh, it's more important to, uh, you know, dress the animal's uh, hide for, uh, for later use uh, as, as much as it is to moving fleshy parts for meals. So for example, in, in uh, California, there was a time when um, the hides of cattle were almost more important than the meat. So if you were a British ship traveling up the coast of California, you know, writing in their journals, oh my God, there's more cattle than we've ever seen and they never seem to end. You know, the Californians have endless cattle. Um, they were allowed to send a longboat to shore uh, to get provisions, including taking meat from the herds, as long as they skinned the cow carefully and left the hide folded neatly under a rock, they could take all the beef they wanted, right? So as a zooarchaeologist working later with California State Parks at the Bolkoff Adobe, an entire cow came out of one of the units, an articulated cow, because the meat wasn't important, the hide was what was important, right? So seeing the cut marks for the skinning, for the hide, dressing the hide was the kind of principal clue as opposed to disarticulation and defleshing for that animal. Great. Well, that's the question. Thank Great. you. So yeah, maybe we'll go with that first question. Um, how do you know when the markings on the bones are injuries or markings made after death? Uh, Perimortem or postmortem, right? So part of that is the work we do, um, say the work of ethnoarchaeologists. So, um, for example, Nelson Gonzalez, who gave us this uh, specimen here, um, also demonstrated the way that he learned as a young shepherd in the mountains of Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado, how to butcher a cap rind. Um, we saw the process, right? So again, understanding the placement of the cut marks at articulations, at muscle attachments, or say in locations that show a skinning process, right? We understand that through ethnoarchaeological practices. Um, you know, the way Nelson Gonzalez does it is really different than the way Mr. Nechim Buffet taught me in Southern Africa. Even though those animal bodies were the same, caprines, uh, it was done very different by a Hanisro man than it was done by a Venda man. But watching that process helped us train up to understand where to expect those cut marks, right? And there's also, um, you know, there's a lot of work done, especially by those folks working in paleoanthropology about, you know, bones that are being trampled at watering holes. They end up getting all these like kind of erratic scratch marks in different directions. That's not a, a well-placed cut mark specifically in a place to take off a muscle or take apart an animal. It's something that is uh, the hallmark of a different taphonomic process. Um, probably other animals trampling bones as they got to the watering hole, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. So sort of related to that is, is can you tell if if animals were killed, a lot of animals were killed at once, or if they were killed one after another over a long time period, like how does that look in the archeological record when you're working on an yeah. assemblage? So there's two, there's, there's a couple of questions you're asking there. One, one is what's the mortality profile of the assemblage, right? That, do you have the, the very young, the neonates all the way through to the very aged, the, you know, the, the decrepit, you know, you know, teeth worn down to the nubs, old ones, 
Um, that's one way of looking at it, right? Or there's uh, the hunters having a very selective um, range of animals they're choosing or domestic, uh, you know, shepherds and, and others. Are they, are they only picking, you know, one sex? Are they only picking one age? Are they waiting? You know, we had the discussion about the age of pigs. Um, we, we look at that mortality profile to give us some information. But taphonomy also has a role to play here, right? That um, if there is a mass kill, like at the Ol Olsen Chubbuck site, with the buffalo jump, running them off the cliff. Um, that's a little bit different than if you are talking about um, animals that are swept into the corner of a river through flooding actions and deposited through these alluvial forces um, that may be collecting these bones. That's something that paleoanthropologists particularly freak out about, trying to figure out if they're looking at something that's actually a collection of bones through human action or hominid action, as opposed to something that was um, gathered by natural forces, right? The natural nat um, natural collection of those bones or, you know, thinking about uh, predators themselves collecting bones and adding them to uh, a particular excavated locus um, may be important for somebody who's finding the tongue child, but not so much for somebody who's interested in the culinary arts of, of modern homo sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So we have two more questions here and then we can wrap up, I think. So one is how do you think that using these animals to perform one's religion affected culinary traditions in that area? That's a big question. <laughs> yeah. So again, um, religion is, uh, you know, archaeology have a really hard time with that. Uh, trying to study ritual and performance and human behavior in a patterned way. I mean, that's really our entree point to things like religion, you know, looking at pattern behavior that uh, is related to um, somebody's ritual practice. And I, I have to say, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a cop out sometimes when archeologists say, well, I don't know what this pattern behavior is. It must be a ritual. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that we do. Um, but as far as culinary traditions, um, there are multiple ways that we can try to tie these animal remains into the way people are doing the kind of quotidian work of feeding their families and themselves, right? So A, there's the pattern, right? There's the repetition of it. B, there's the context. Like any archaeological uh, material, the context in which it's discovered is clutch. So being able to say, well, I found these portions of animal bodies in association with um, culinary tools like ceramics, right? They're hardworking ceramics that are meant to cook meals. There's, there's um, other toolkits designed to prepare meals, right? There's the location of, you know, if, if it's a midden in which the material is being collected is one thing versus if it's just a little bit of overflow at a hearth that's being swept into the corner of a room, right? The corners of a room are fantastic for archaeologists. Um, those contexts help us kind of tease apart which animals were becoming part of uh, cuisine, uh, as opposed to um, maybe playing a more special role. Um, the context of the way macaws, scarlet macaws, are being buried at the uh, at the, uh, the threshold of kivas, you know, houses of worship in the American Southwest before contact, um, is something that the whole body is there, right? It's very minimally modified, and it's placed in a very special location in a very special facility at this community. Um, that context tells us very likely they weren't, you know, having, you know, scarlet macaw popsicles here. They're doing something very specific with the animals um, that's different than the quotidian kind of refuse that you would find from making food. So I hope that starts to. Yeah, thank you. And then this last question, I think, is a really nice one to end on because it sort of looks to the, this addresses the, the sort of, how does archaeology help us understand where we are and where we're going? Um, the person asked, how important are archaeological collections of faunal remains for the study of climate change? Mm, that's a big one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so understanding how um, animals uh, and their relationship with the environment and, of course, with the, with the Anthropocene is uh, an important uh, work uh, is an important ongoing, uh, you know, job of archaeology. And so, um, you know, I, with a bunch of co-authors, uh, worked on a paper in which, um, you know, the Anthropocene is explored through uh, a new North American land mammal age, right, in which, uh, you know, 
paleontologists like to look at it in terms of what's the index fossil that tells you this is happening, right? And and I used um, the horse as an example as a domesticate reintroduced to North America that expands beyond um, colonial uh, settlements much faster because they get loose, right? You look at the thousands of horses that are loose and wild in the American West right now um, and burrows, my goodness, you know, there's a whole campaign of the Park Service running around with helicopters and paintball guns shooting them in the butt trying to count them. There's so many of them. Um, these animals get away and they create, you know, new community, they, they reproduce and they, they expand into new territories. Um, so when they do that, uh, they are also following um, fodder, right? They're following forage, they're following water and, and, and plant resources. And as uh, climate change um, affects those resources, we also see the contraction and expansion of those ranges, right? Uh, in, in Southern Africa, uh, with increasing drought, with these periods of intense flooding. Um, in 2000, I was uh, fortunate enough to be there for the 500-year uh, flood that wiped out most of the infrastructure in northern South Africa. And then five years later, there was another 500-year flood. And five years after that, there was another 500. They're called the 500-year flood because they're only supposed to happen every 500 years, right? Not every five, 10 years. And so the... Uh, the, the, the zoologists and archaeologists kind of trying to look at what are the baseline assumptions about the range um, and, um, and population density of animals in these locations compared to the range and density of populations uh, with, in, with the increasing cycles of, of, of climate change. Um, we have to have some baseline. So the idea that the, the animals themselves are a testimony to what was there over a long time, right? Archaeologists are really good at seeing the depth of time um, as opposed to the recent past is one of the, the toolkits that archaeologists offer um, the, the scientists studying climate change. Because, you know, I, I, always, I often talk about certain disciplines, they go out and they say, yes, I've gathered, you know, 10 years of ecological data in this forest. And I go, 10 years, huh? Well, you know, uh, I've got colleagues like Dr. Kansa here, who's looking at you know thousands of years in the human past. Um, my uh, my colleague, Dr. G uh, Gabriel Sanchez, you know, at Washington, you know, he's looking at um, the the signal through time of you know the, of animals that were accessed by Native Californians. That it's much deeper than five, ten years, right? And that baseline provides a much more robust set of data for climate scientists to kind of evaluate, well, what are the animals doing now, those who are indicator species uh, of, of uh, what's going on with our natural environment? Thanks, yeah, this is obviously, you're very passionate about this subject. And I, we have a question, just one final question, asking what, when did you realize you wanted to focus on zooarchaeology? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it, it was a mix as a mix of things, but um, I, I have a degree in mechanical engineering. I come from the industry. Um, and uh, one of the things about bone uh, is that uh, you can model uh, a bunch of different things from it that makes sense to an engineer. So biomechanics, um, one of the papers I did with uh, a student, uh, Mario Castillo, um, focuses on the energetics of equid motion through mountainous landscapes because a lot of um, the original uh, work done on uh, studying modeling mathematically travel was done based on the model of uh, you know Swiss soldiers hiking over the Alps uh, and so that doesn't work very well for historical archaeologists looking at time periods in which horses were the most imp important um, vehicle of war, vehicle of transfer of trade and communication, transportation, right? So uh, biomechanics is something that um, we can study through the anatomical layout of a skeleton. Um, and also fracture mechanics. So um, the way bone breaks, understanding uh, whether or not you're looking at something that was broken by a stone tool or by the carnassial pair of a carnivore trying to clomp down and chop through a, be a bone is something that a mechanical engineer is uniquely uh, happy to look at through um, fracture mechanics. And so uh, in graduate school, um, it was something that was a unique marriage of my background in mechanical engineering with uh, interest in how archeology span serves the needs of contemporary communities um, with respect to land and water rights. And this seemed to be one methodology that allowed me to bring those two things together. Great, well, thank you so much for coming today and sharing your expertise and knowledge and answering the questions from the public. 
we appreciate you joining us. And thank you to the listeners who joined us today and um, to those who sent in questions. Um, I'd like to invite you to our next one, which is um, going to be at two o'clock today at the same link. And you ask questions at the same link as well. If you wanna join us, AJ White is gonna be talking about what we can learn from studying ancient poop. So that should be very exciting and we hope to see you there. And uh, thanks everyone and we'll see you soon. Thank you, have a good one.